Go ahead and bring up our scripture slide. There we go. This is familiar to all of us that grew up in Baptist churches. Um, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 1 and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, it's good to be back with, with you all again. And uh, when I went back, you, you noticed there's a video camera in the back of the room. This is a part of my online ministry, Church Rebirth Ministry. So I record the, the services anywhere I go. And if I'm not preaching somewhere, then I post something online. And when I went back to edit this week's video, I realized how long I preached last Sunday. Now, what are you laughing about? It, 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 was, it was much longer than you wanted and much longer than I wanted. And so I figured if, if we just close in prayer right now, we'd be on average for a 30-minute service for two weeks in a row. Anybody in favor of that? <laughs> that, that would be a no. Well, you you're, you're very gracious last week, and I appreciate it. And uh, I, I, I promise that we won't go nearly that long this week, maybe three-fourths of that long. But anyway, gl glad to be with you. Uh, the video that I showed you, my, my younger brother, who's a, a pastor, been at his church for 30 years now, told me about this story last week. And I said, man, I, I need to find a good sermon to go with that illustration. And it just so happens because of where you are in your life story and your history and your timeline as a church, anticipating the arrival of a new pastor in leadership, that this is a word that sort of fits in there. I don't know if any of you saw this when this was originally broadcast. I had not. There are several versions of this. You can look them up on, on YouTube. Uh, but this man who is what? He's a carpet cleaner of all things. He works for his brother. That's what he does for a living. But he learned as a child when, when he, he spent a lot of his, his school age years in, in the Washington, D.C. suburbs. And Washington, D.C. is a true, it's an eth ethnic melting pot. And so there were a lot of kids that he went to school that spoke other languages, and he just got curious about connecting with them. So he would ask them to explain words in their language. And he discovered that he had this rare gift. Uh, do we have any super polyglots here that say you know what it's like to, to live in a world life like that? A any of you taken a, a, a foreign language in school? Uh, would you take French? You take Spanish, German, Latin. Wow, wow. So can you stand up and, and cite something in those languages now? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I took Spanish. Of course, I'm from Texas. Um, and, and in college and seminary, I took Greek and, and took Hebrew. Uh, and don't ask me to speak in any of those. But I was struck by this because if you were to summarize telling somebody about the, the interview that you just saw about this young man. What was the most poignant thing that he said about this gift that he has that he continues to pursue? Forty languages now. Even now. Anything stand out in your mind of what, what he said that was the most poignant thing? Absolutely. It helped him connect with people. He discovered that when he spoke in the language of somebody else, they were more open. And I thought the other thing was that friendships developed out of his gift and use of their language to speak to them in. When I read this passage out of John's Gospel, we know we've just come through the Christmas season, and we know that, that Matthew uh, has an account about the, the coming of Jesus. Luke has an account about the coming of Jesus. Mark doesn't mention it at all. And this is John's version of the coming of Jesus. He doesn't talk about mangers and animals and shepherds. He talks about the nature of Christ in what? Becoming flesh. One of the cardinal concepts of evangelical Christianity that goes all the way back to the roots of, of Christ's life is this doctrine we now know as the Incarnation. Uh, that, that's from, a, from a, a Greek word or a Latin word that simply means in the flesh. And that's what John does to describe the coming of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. He's talking about Jesus. The Word was what? With God. And the Word was God. Now that, that, was, that was powerful enough. But then he goes on in verse 14 and says, And the Word did what? Became flesh and lived among us. And we saw His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace 
and truth. The, the doctrine of the incarnation, that God became flesh, was, was the first debated concept in, in Christian history. I don't know if you know that or not. There, there were groups that, 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 that arose at the time of Christians that called themselves believers, and they didn't believe this doctrine. They didn't believe that Jesus was God who became flesh. And it took a couple of hundred years before the church finally defined this and said, if you're going to be a Bible-believing New Testament Christian, this is what it is important to believe. And in, in the Council of Nicaea in 325, um, they, uh, they define their concept of the understanding of this doctrine and said this is what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You may not know it, but some of the other non-evangelical groups like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, one of them believes that Jesus was an angel. One of them believes that he was a created being. One of them even believes that he was the brother of Satan. You got that? Yeah, yeah, some of you know that. So I, I'm thinking for us in this context for... First Baptist Church, Sand Ridge. You know, what, what can be one of the more compelling things that is a part of your future and your story going forward and the anticipation of a new spiritual leader to come in and lead you in that direction? So we put the, the title slide up there. Implications from the Incarnation. Because this doctrine, this doctrine of the Incarnation permeates everything that we are if we're true believers and everything that we should be about as a New Testament church. So this is going to be my cue to go to the next slide. So, so we're having to do this old school, so y'all uh, indulge Karen that she can read my sign language here. Yeah, okay. So it, it, first, the implication of the, of the incarnation is its role in what? In our redemption. Its role in our redemption. Now when we talk about redemption, what are we talking about? The fact that we were born as what? As sinners. We were dead in sin. And a consequence of being born in sin means that we... Uh, unless something changes, we have this destiny of being separated from God eternally in death. And, and we know that as hell. So the fact was that Jesus needed to become flesh in order for us to experience redemption. Out of Hebrews chapter 2, and, and I'm among those scholars who does, does not believe we know who actually wrote Hebrews. He was somebody well versed in Jewish history and Jewish theology. Um, I, don't think it was, I don't think it was the Apostle Paul, but it doesn't matter. God knew who it was. And, and his whole thing, he's talking about the nature of Christ in relationship to Jewish law and history. In Hebrews chapter 2, we read these words, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of his suffering, death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for who? For everyone. So who here is included in the everyone? Everyone pretty dumb question, but everyone is included. He, he says here that we, we know, now, you may not know this, but um, this writer cites a psalm uh, when he talks about he, he made him a little lower than the angels. In the Hebrew, in that psalm, it's not, the word is not angel there, but God. And we don't know why this New Testament writer, other than the Greek translation, the Septuagint of the Old Testament, was translated in Greek, and those translators substituted the word angel for the word God. Now, you, you take it up with God when you get to heaven and ask him why he let that happen. But anyway, no, no, I think the writer of Hebrews was actually making a point here. He says, when you think about Jesus and who he was in his nature, took him and made him what? Lower than the angels, which means, number one, he was not an angel. But he says he was God. And his reason for doing that was by the grace of God, he might, what, taste death for everyone. Say, no, no incarnation, no sacrifice. And no incarnation, no atonement. Now, you may say, well, 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 Pastor, what about that season of history in the Old Testament? Beginning with, what, with, with Abraham, when, when the nation of Israel was given birth to, and his descendants. And the giving of the law that involved a sacrificial system. Didn't the sacrifice of those animals back then accomplish atonement? When you go and you read Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, you know what, it was never intended that the blood of bulls and goats would take away anybody's sins. It forestalled judgment until Jesus came. So the truth of the matter is, those who believed in the coming of Christ, those who embraced the knowledge of God in the Old Testament, their, their sins were, were put on hold until Jesus came, and then their sins were laid on Him in the atonement on the cross. It was never intended. So without the, the incarnation, without God becoming flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, there would have been no, no sacrifice that would have been sufficient. 
nor would there have been sacrifice or an inc- with no, or inc- no atonement, which means our sins would not have been paid for. I don't know about you, but that's not a good idea. I, that's not good news to me. So, so the first implication of the incarnation is this, no sacrifice, no atonement. And then its role in our purpose. And when I say our purpose, I'm talking about as, as Christ followers as those who have confessed our faith in Christ, as those who have experienced, what, the new birth within us, then we are given, what, an eternal purpose. And, and collectively, when we come, become a part of a, of a local body of believers, then it becomes a collective purpose that we should share. So what are the implications of the incarnation in our purpose? We go to 1 Peter chapter 2 to read, for some of us, this is a very familiar passage as well. For you have been called, he's talking about believers here, Peter's writing this, for this purpose, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you would follow in his steps. He who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being abusively insulted, he did not insult in return. While suffering, he did not threaten but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself brought our sins in his body up on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And by his wounds you are healed. So its role in our purpose, so the, the fact that, that, that Jesus was God who became flesh for our purpose, it, it, it gives us a purpose. It didn't just provide us redemption and atonement, it gave us a purpose in our life. He does this by declaration. Peter declares what our purpose is supposed to be. He said, for, for, for this is what you were called to, to what? To follow the example of who? The example of Christ. Now, is that your expectation of yourself? Do you believe that you're, you're called to be like Jesus? Do you, do you think you're called to be like Jesus? Is he the supreme example of that? So if, if we understand what the purpose of Christ was, and Peter says we're supposed to follow in his steps, then his purpose should become our purpose. And Jesus declared in the Gospels when he was confronted about why he did what he did, he, he, he gave this clear statement about his purpose. I came to what? Seek and to save who? That which was lost. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's what his, the redemption story was all about. His coming to do the necessary thing in order to achieve that. And then Peter comes along and says, listen, that wasn't just his purpose, but in his, his death and in his atonement and his resurrection, that becomes our purpose. So we're supposed to be following in his steps. So the implications of the incarnation for you and I individually is that people that don't know God, people that don't own a Bible, and you might be surprised in America how many people don't, how many people don't. There's no surprise at how many people own one and don't know anything about it, but that's a different story altogether. He says that, that, that our purpose becomes the purpose of Christ so that people, when they encounter us, they should be encountering an incarnation of Jesus through us. Which is the reason that I think we're supposed to talk differently. Hear, hear? Are you awake? We're supposed to talk differently. Hear, hear? hear. All, right, all right, just checking, just checking. We're supposed to live differently. Hear, hear? You're a little weak on that. I think we need to have a prayer meeting here or something. Peter declares what? Most of us believe to be true, but then, you know, how true actually is it? What, what is it that, that, um, that we call a person who claims to be a Christ follower and doesn't live like it? Hypocrite. See, we all know that word, don't you? you? You know what the word hypocrite actually means? It's from the Greek word hypokritos. It means to act or to pretend. The incarnation means there should be no pretense. That it just as, as Jesus was holy, lived a sacred, sanctified life, he calls on us to do that. And then by demonstration, Jesus demonstrated that by what? By going through the life and enduring the things he did, not for himself. He had nothing to gain by his, his life. He had nothing to gain by his arrest. He had nothing to gain by his, his punishment. He had nothing to gain by his crucifixion. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for who? He did it for us. 
The implication of the incarnation in our purpose is that, that, that we're called to holiness. Simply means being set apart to God. So there should, should be something distinctive about a believer and how we live and how we act and how we talk and where we go and what we do and what our hands are engaged in and where our feet take us. But unfortunately, far too often, that's not the case. But the, in, the, the implication of the incarnation for us is it gives us a purpose, which is the same purpose and identity that Jesus had. Number three, its role in our process. Its role in our process. So we have, we have the redemption um, declared by Jesus. No incarnation, no redemption, no forgiveness, no atonement. We have a a purpose that's declared for us that we're supposed to be like Jesus in conduct and character. You know, a, a, a sad footnote on that is that I don't know if you've seen the statistics in America, but you know what the, 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 the rate of difference is between Christian families that end up in divorce and non-Christian families? You know what the difference is? None. None. The same thing could be said about children. You know, how many, how many children get in trouble growing up? The difference between believers and non-believers? None. There's something wrong with that picture. Hear, hear? Absolutely. So our role in the process, so we have this purpose. So how do we, how do we engage effectively to be and to do what Peter says we're supposed to, following the example of the incarnation of Jesus? This is, this is my wife will tell you, this may be my favorite passage in the New Testament. Because when I embraced this and understood this, it made a radical change in my call and my ministry in my life. Paul writes these words in 1 Corinthians 9, For though I am free from all people, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may gain more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might gain the Jews. To those who were under the law, I became as one under the law though not being under the law myself, so that I might gain those who are under the law. To those who are without law, I became as one without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might gain those who are without the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might gain the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that, so that by all means I might save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. A little personal footnote here. Um, nobody in this room really knows me or my wife. You've seen me a couple of Sundays now. I've got to spend a little extra time with Brian this week doing an interview. But, but you know what? So here's a, here's a little bit of footnote about, about Pastor James. Is I ride a motorcycle. I've been riding motorcycles for 50 years. I've probably logged 150,000 miles on a motorcycle. The one that I currently have, which is 20 years old, I've logged 100,000 miles on it. I ride a motorcycle. Because I ride a motorcycle, I've been able to engage people that ride motorcycles and build relationships and friendships with them. That is, open the door for the gospel to share Jesus with them. That's what Paul is talking about here. I like to hunt. Uh, I, I didn't grow up doing a lot of hunting, but I was exposed to it. I was around it. And so I, since I've been in, in South Carolina, I've done a whole lot more hunting. We just finished deer season. I have four of those things in my, my freezer right now, or portions of those. I spent yesterday smoking some venison jerky. And no, you can't have any. Um, <laughs> and, and, and one of the things I spent more time hunting since I've been here is, is I hunt wild hogs. So if you or anybody you know has a wild hog problem, then just contact me and I'll come and execute judgment on them and get them out of your way. Um, and, and, and because I, I, I hunt with some other guys, uh, we can either shoot them or we can stab them. The biggest one I have, one man on my wall in my office, is it was a 500 pound boar. Got great big old cutters on it that were killed with a knife, okay? Now... <laughs> Now, that may sound gross to you, but when you sit down to eat some of it, you're thankful for every bit of that. You see, the, the guys that I hunt with, not all of them are Christ followers. But because I hunt and I go out there and do that with them, their lives are open. I build a relationship. I do exactly what Paul is talking about here. That's what the incarnation is supposed to be about. 
Paul says, I recognize that every culture is not the same. Every people group is not the same. And he said, in order for me to be the incarnation of Jesus that's going to make a difference in their lives, I need to recognize the distinctiveness about who they are. As much as the young man who learned to speak the language so that he could what? He could connect with people and friendships would grow out of that. And so out of my hunting experience, just like out of my motorcycle experience, just out of, out of fishing experience, just out of all of those kind of things, because those are activities that take place outside of what? The four walls of the church. Uh, you know, I, I pastored for over 40 years, and, and, and incarnation for me meant not spending all my time sitting in a study during the course of the week. But being outside of the walls of the building, engaging people, connecting with people, building relationships with people, so that I would have the privilege and the opportunity to share Jesus with them. All right, let's fill in these blanks. First, as, as the, our, the, our, its role in our process as to the objects of our efforts. As to the objects of our efforts. Now, we're not doing this for us, except our obedience or our sense of spiritual obedience to Christ. But we do this. Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 1, he says, I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Now, what is a debtor? M most of us, if, if we have a credit card, we know what a debtor is. <laughs> If we have a car payment, we know what a debtor is. If we have a mortgage, we know what a debtor is. A debtor is somebody that, what, owes something to someone else. Now, Paul is famously quoted as saying, Owe oh, no man anything except to love. Well, this is the ultimate expression of love. He says the object of our effort should be those people who are not like us. He said, in this case, I'm a debtor to the Greek. In this word, the word translated here means ethnos. It just means somebody who's not Jewish. <laughs> but he said it even goes so far as to doing it for the sake of even the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. The objects of our efforts should be those people that aren't where we are and don't know what we know and haven't been blessed to be, have ra been raised in an environment where Christ was made known to us at a young age. You know, statistically now that, that almost two-thirds of, of Americans are, the, are the, the numbers that are claiming some sort of a religious affiliation. That means that almost 40% don't have any interest in God or formal spiritual expression through a church. Paul says it, the role of the incarnation in our process is recognizing the objects of our efforts. It's not for ourselves. It's not for those that already know Jesus. It's for those who do not know Jesus. Are we in agreement on that? That, that the reason this church, I don't, how old is, is this church? What year was it started? When? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. None of you were around when it started, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> I bet we can guess why it was started. You, you think so? Why do you think this church was started? Number one, so that believers would have a place to gather and worship. We can agree to that. But is that the only reason the church exists? Or the church exists as a place where people can come and worship God and get their marching orders to go out to the people that don't know God and introduce them to Him? Would anybody disagree with that? All right, go to the next slide. And its role in our process as to the objectives, as to the objective of our effort. Paul said in that passage in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, you know, I, to, to, the, to the Roman I became like a, a Roman, to the barbarian like a barbarian, all these people. He said, I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might, what, win some. He said, the objective of why I do what I do is so that people that don't know Jesus Christ can have an introduction to Jesus Christ. And I do it, the objective is that my... I might share in the glory of the gospel. That, that the atonement and the gospel message just wasn't for Jesus to preach. It wasn't just for the apostles to preach. But it was for everyone who names the name of Jesus that others that don't know him might connect with him. Back in the 1950s, uh, there was a, a couple that met in college in, in Oregon, the state of Oregon. And uh, Jim Elliott um, felt that God was calling him to be a, a missionary. 
Elizabeth, I don't remember what her maiden name was, but she felt that God was calling her to be a missionary too. They both were Christ followers, but they, they felt called to do missions. The only problem was they loved each other, they, they courted each other, but he felt called to go to South America, she felt called to go to Africa. <laughs> and they were both spiritual enough that in their courtship and their conversation, they said, listen, we need to do what God wants us to do and not what we want to do. And so Jim says, listen, you go to Africa, I'll go to South America, we'll just go and do what God would have us to do. So they, they, went to, uh, they went to Ecuador, and there they, they became in, in sort of a partnership with four other couples. And these are the men, Roger uh, Udarian, Pete Fleming, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and Ed McCauley. And they formed this partnership because they're, they're called, Jim's primary call and Elizabeth joined him there as husband and wife. They went there. He wanted to, he wanted to reach a people group that had never heard the gospel. Never heard the gospel. I don't know if you know this, but that was Paul's passion too. He wanted to go where Christ had not been known in order that he might make Christ known. The expression of the incarnation in his life. And so they went there and they partnered with these other couples and they found this, this indigenous tribal group of people called Akas that were there along the Amazon in the jungle that they had never heard the gospel. And every white man they had ever encountered, they killed them. So this was a brutal, primitive tribe of Indians living in the jungle, but, but they felt called to engage them, what, for the sake of the gospel. Uh, Nate Saint was a pilot. He had this little yellow airplane, and so he, he developed some, some engineering things for this plane that nobody had known before. He put an auxiliary fuel, fuel tank on that thing that had never been done before so they could fly longer. They figured out when they, they flew over this village, he figured out a way to circle that plane in, in such a slow, slow, slow circle that they could, they could lower a rope with a bucket on the bottom of it, and that bucket would do this until slowly, 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 it would come to a standstill while they circled and they put items in there to, to pass along to those Indians to gain their trust and their friendship. And, and then they, they, they'd learn some words, and so they'd, they'd shout those words out of the windows so that they, the Indians there would recognize their voice and not be afraid of them. And they finally found a place to land, a little sandy beach. They called it Palm Beach, where they learned to, to land that plane. And they, they had the first encounter with these Indians. And they'd prayed about when, when they were going to go back and be able to start engaging them for the sake of the gospel. Next slide. On this date, January the 8th in 1956, those five men went to Palm Beach and a group of Indian men came out from the village and met them there and widowed their wives and orphaned their children. All five of those men were killed because they were trying to be incarnational. And it made international news. We have a copy of the Life magazine that the original story was in that has all the pictures there. The military was sent in. It made big news that they had died. And they, they recovered the bodies and the, the planes. And so here you have these wives with children now that, you know, what do they do? Well, well, well three of them went back to the States. Um, Rachel Saint and Elizabeth Elliot and their children. Um, after being gone for a little while to memorialize their husbands, they felt called that, that God had called them to continue the mission. They went back to Ecuador. If you want to know what our incarnation looks like, this is what incarnation looks like. They went back there and they discovered two women who had, had escaped from that village. They became friends and those women taught them some of the language of the Aka tribe. Next slide. And in 1958, two years after her husband had been martyred for the sake of the gospel, Elizabeth Elliot and her daughter Valerie moved into that village of those killers. And because she was a woman and not perceived as a threat, she was welcomed into that village. And she wrote about that experience in this book called The Savage, My Kinsman. And you know what happened? By her living among them and spending time with them, her daughter played with their kids. She simply became another woman in that village. They were open to the gospel. And they became disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. That is what the incarnation is supposed to be about. I think that may be our last slide. Is that our last slide? Okay, that's our last slide. 
So here's my challenge to you, my question to you this morning. Uh, we're going to do something different, not, not in the bulletins, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask my wife, come up here and find a, a song you can play on the piano. <laughs> she can do this. She can do this. Because my, my invitation, my challenge to you is, is going to be different than it normally is. I, I don't, we're not going to sing the invitation hymn. She's going to simply play some music as the background here. And here are the three questions I want to challenge you with during this time of commitment. One is, do you want to be an incarnational disciple? To be what Jesus came to do and what Jesus called you to do. Number two, in the pastor you have coming, do you want him to be an incarnational spiritual leader? So that he's engaging people that otherwise might not be engaged, that may never darken the door of this church until they encounter somebody outside of the walls of this church to build a relationship with them, a friendship with them, in order that they might receive the gospel. And the third thing is, and the last thing, is do you want him to provide leadership for you individually and you as a church to become the incarnational people that God would have you to be? I'm going to pray. You can start playing any time. I'm going to pray. And, and my invitation to you is, if those are your three desires that you would like for us to pray about going forward, I simply want you to stand in your place and remain standing until everybody's had a chance to respond Father right now um, I thank you for this holy privilege that you call me to come here to lay out this challenge because you alone know what the future of this church is help us to respond honestly and obediently to express the desire of our heart to follow the example of Jesus and follow in his steps incarnationally. Now help us have the courage to stand. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Father, you alone know the heart. So for these who are testifying to the desire of their heart, recognizing that we could not know you except Jesus became flesh, and that you didn't save us just so that we might be saved, but you saved us in order that we might serve not just you and each other but to serve a world that does not know Jesus Christ so in the expression of their desire I ask the holy work of the Spirit of God on them that you would help them understand what incarnation looks like for them where they are and who they are to open their eyes to see the people that they encounter all week long that may not know you. And that, Father, as they anticipate the arrival of a new pastor, that, Lord, you would bring a man in whose soul is on fire with the passion that Paul had to become all things to all men that by all possible means they might experience your grace and your forgiveness. And that, Father, then as he stands to lead them, that you would grant him an anointing of leadership. And you would grant them anointing of fellowship to walk alongside of him. So that people can be reached and your kingdom expanded and Jesus glorified. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things and for his sake. Amen.